tonight, but that you would bring out your Bibles and actually follow along with me tonight because I would want you to see these words for yourself in the Bible. So I pray that you would take the time out, get out your Bible, get out a notebook, get out a pencil, because we've been doing a word study since this past few weeks. The Lord put it on the girls' heart to do a word study. And the Lord has blessed me with the word tonight, Lord. So our word study tonight is very common to us. It is a com it's a common word that we use a lot. And we say it in our everyday life. We say it in our prayers all day long. We say this name all day long, and that word is Lord. Lord God, Lord Jesus, Lord, we thank you. We say it a lot in our prayers, amen? But do we know, when we call Jesus Lord, do we know what we're saying? Do we know how important it is? This is not a word that we should take lightly or take for granted. But when we address God as Lord, we are to do so with a deep reverence. Amen? So tonight, like I said, bring out your Bibles because we're going to find out the biblical meaning of the word Lord. Amen? So what we need to know first off is, is that the Bible uses the word Lord in two ways. So I'm going to explain one way and then the other way. So the first way that I would like to explain is the way that you will find it in the Old Testament. And you could find it all throughout the Bible, but I'm going to give you a few examples of it, of the word Lord, and it is all in capital letters. For example, if you go to your Bible, you go to Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, scripture that is well known to us. I would love if you girls could go there so you could see this for yourself. <coughs> It's Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, and it says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Now, if you look at the word Lord there, that is all capital letters. It's all in caps. Now, if you could go to Exodus 3, verse 14 through 15, and it says, God said to Moses, we all know the story of how Moses was at the burning bush and God tells him, you know, everything about Egypt, how he wants to set his people free. And Moses asks the question, who will I say sent me? And this is where we get the scripture in Exodus 3, 14 through 15. It says, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me. God also said to Moses, say this to the people, the Lord, the God of your fathers has sent me. Now if you look there, folly, you'll see the word Lord in all capital letters. Amen? So, and you'll not just find this in two scriptures, but you will find it all throughout the Bible. So whenever you see the word Lord in all capital letters, this is the Hebrew name for God, which is Yahweh, a name that, that is very big in Christianity. It's called Yahweh. So Yahweh means that God is self-existent. He doesn't need anything to survive. He himself is self-existent. It also means that he is eternal. He never had a beginning. He was never created, but he always was, is, and always will be. He is never changing. There is nothing about him that will ever change, nothing in his character. He doesn't grow old. He doesn't anything like that. He is never changing. He is also self-sufficient. He himself is enough. And rather getting something from other sources, like he needs something to be more godly. He needs more love. He needs more knowledge. He needs more all-knowing, more wisdom. He doesn't need anymore because in himself, he is self-sufficient. We get all of that from him, amen? And also, it means that he does not compare to no one. This is why he tells Moses, I am who I am, meaning no one compares to me. There is no one like me, amen? So the name Yahweh is highly honored amongst the Jews. 
so much so that they would not even say it out loud. And to prevent others from saying this name, the scribes who were responsible for copying the original text wouldn't even write the name Yahweh. But instead, what they did here is they took letters from the word Yahweh and took letters from the Hebrew word Adonai, which means Lord, and they put them together. So that way, when people see this name, they would know that it's Yahweh, but they are not to say it out loud due to respect and honor of this name. So what they would say Lord instead, but knowing that it means this is his name, Yahweh. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. So they would do this all out of respect for God and for his holy name. And also, the English translations of what we have today in our Bible did the exact same thing. So instead of seeing Yahweh, we see the Lord. Like it should have been said, the original text was supposed to be, you shall love Yahweh, your God, with all your heart and with all your might and with all your soul. But instead, due to honor and respect and reverence of his name, it's the Lord in all caps. And then, so whenever, again, you see the word Lord in all capital letters, this is referring to God's holy name. And we, too, are to honor and respect his name as self-sufficient, self-existent, holy and righteous God. Amen to honor and reverence his name. So now I want to look at the second way the word Lord is used in the Bible. And <clears throat> you'll see this all throughout the Bible too. It is the Greek word, just regular Lord with all, without capital letters. It is just Lord. And the Greek, the Greek name for this is, I don't, I don't even think I'm going to pronounce it right, but it's Kaleas. Kaleas. I can't even say it right. But this basically just means supreme in authority. Someone who has full control over a nation or over a person. In, in other words, it's basically saying a master or an owner of a nation or a person. Amen. So this Greek word is found 748 times in the Bible. And most of the time it refers to Jesus being Lord, but there's a few times in the Bible that it actually refers to people, people who are in higher authority, who have high authority. For example, if you would like to turn to your Bibles and see this for yourself, in 1 Peter 3, verse 6, <clears throat> Peter is talking about how Sarah called Abraham her Lord. But if you notice, if you go to the scripture, it's not all capitals, but what it is, it's a lowercase l. It's not capital L, it's lowercase l. So whenever you see a lowercase l, it's referring to people. It's not referring to God or Yahweh, but it's referring to someone who has authority over someone else. And then we see this a lot, too, in our day and age, uh, the England people. They'll say, Lord William, Lord, you know, whatever. This is referring to someone who has authority over a nation or a country or, you know, anything like that. Just someone who's in a higher rank than others. Amen. But when it comes to Jesus, when he is called Lord in the Bible, notice how the L here is capital L. For, for example, if you go to your Bibles again, go to Luke chapter 2, verse 11. And this speaks of Jesus being born as a baby. And it says, Today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And that is capital L. So it's amazing that even as Jesus was a baby being born, he was already Lord. Beautiful. First Peter 3, verse 15 says, In your heart, honor Christ as Lord of your life. Amen. So again, every time you see Lord with the capital L, that is always referring to Jesus being in authority over all. Not some, but over all. Amen. 
and it talks about his role in being Lord and how to honor his name. So, hold on one second. Amen. So when he is Lord in these contexts, in these scriptures, this is talking about that Jesus is the supreme sovereign ruler, the one who has authority to rule and to do whatever it is that pleases him. He's the one that gives the orders. He's the one that gives the commands. He is the owner and the master over every single thing that was ever created. He is Lord over the plants. He is Lord over the sky. He is Lord over the grass, the lilies, the flowers. The Bible says in the book of Job that even the, the, the lightning is at his command and they asked him, what shall we do? And we could find that in the book of Job. But he is Lord over all created things. And everything is in his power and in his command. Matthew 28, verse 18 says that Jesus has the authority in heaven and on earth that everything has been given to him. Jesus speaks of himself of being Lord over the Sabbath in Luke 6, verse 5. There is no human being that is above him. No one gives him orders or gives him commands. Rather, he is the one who gives orders and commands. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 21 says, He is far above all authority, power, and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. So that is to say, whatever, whoever is in authority here on earth, whether that be a president, a senator, whatever it is, a queen, a king, Christ is above them. He is the Lord over them. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. So there is no one above him. Philippians chapter 2, a well-known verse, talks about that at his name, meaning Jesus, the Lord, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. Amen. So we hear it said a lot in the churches and maybe on TV or whenever we tend to hear this a lot when it comes to us giving altar calls or having the gospel being said. We hear it said a lot, come and make Jesus the Lord of your life. Make him Lord of your life. But I'm here to say right now that that is a foolish and unbiblical statement. It is foolish and unbiblical. We don't make him Lord as if we have the authority to make him Lord or as if we have that opportunity or we have to give him that right to make him Lord. Because if we really say that, then what we're saying is that and we're handing it over to Christ. But oh no. We, God does not need our permission to be Lord. There is only one that made him Lord, and that is God, according to Philippians chapter 2. Amen. We don't need to give the almighty God permission and say, here, be Lord over my life. But Jesus Christ is Lord of your life. Amen. He is not Lord over some. He is Lord over all. He is Lord over every creation. And according to Psalms 135, verse 6, it says, The Lord does whatever he pleases in heaven and on earth, in the seas and in all the depths. So if the Lord is Lord over even the seas and the sea creatures and the depths of the earth, what are we to say, I make you Lord? No. He is Lord of our life. He is Lord over all. Amen? Sometimes, I mean, we just want a Savior. We just want the Savior. But she Gaza. We don't want a Lord. We just want Savior. Just give me grace to be saved. But don't give me the grace to be my Lord. That is not the case at all. He is Lord. And as one of my favorite pastors says, his name is Paul Washer, about the topic of Jesus being Lord. He says, you will either bow that day out of the grace that has been given to you 
or you will bow because your kneecaps will be broken out of fear and trembling and to say that he is Lord. Amen. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that he is Lord. So what we need to do, because everybody will recognize this, believers, unbelievers, other religions will finally see that he is the Lord. So what we need to do is we need to already recognize this. We don't make him Lord. We need to acknowledge that he already is Lord. He is already in control, sovereign, all-powerful, all-knowing, Lord of all, the God, the ruler. He is that already. Amen. We just need to see it. We need our eyes to be open to see these things. Amen. So do you know that tonight? Or do we just say, Lord, Lord, and not recognize or realize what we're saying? Do we honor him as Lord? Do we submit to his lordship? Because when you call him Lord, you know what you are really saying. What you are saying is that he is the master. He is the God. And since he is the God, not if, not if he is the God. Since he is Lord, what does that make you? When you cry out to him and you say, Lord, Lord, when you say, Lord, Master, do you recognize your role? When you call him Lord, what does that make you? Think about that for a second. Because I asked myself this question um, when I came to this study. So what does that make you? His servant. Amen? His servant. Better yet, let's take it a step further and use the biblical word for servant in the Greek, which is called doulios. I can't even, I can't even say that word right. Doulos. This word describes not only a servant, how we would see, think a servant, but this word describes a slave a slave who is owned by a master. And a slave's life is not devoted to himself. And what I could get out of this? What could I get out of this? But the slave is devoted to his master, to his Lord. A slave is pleased to obey his master. A slave is not his own, but he is his Lord. According to 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19, it says, You are not your own, but you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Amen? The Bible says that we were once slaves, slaves of sin, according to Romans chapter 6. But when Christ came, he bought us with a price, and not a price of money or means of gold or riches, but a price that was with his blood. And he took you out of slavery of sin and put you into slavery of righteousness. Amen? Just like he says to the, the Egyptians, he tells Moses and the Egyptians, I took you out of that to bring you into this. Meaning, I took you out of slavery of bondage of sin to bring you into slavery of righteousness and peace. Amen? What a beautiful thing to know that. A slave is also devoted to one master. Matthew 6.24 says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will be devoted to one and despise the other. A slave doesn't just call his master Lord. But the slave does what the Lord tells him. According to Luke 6, 46, Jesus asks the question, Why do you call me Lord, Lord? Yet you do not do what I say. Why do we call him Lord? If we don't do what he says, because when we're saying these words, what we're saying is, you are master and I am your slave. I am your servant. Amen. So do you see how important it is? Do we see how important, how this word is to be reverenced and honored when we call him Lord? And how it is to be honored not only with our words, 
but with our actions. And we need to acknowledge that he is Lord already. And we need to know what our role is as servants, as slaves. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. We don't want to be the ones who just says, Lord, Lord. And his response to us would be, away from me. I never knew you. But we want to be the ones who the Lord will tell us, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Amen? So I hope that this message blessed you. I hope it enlightened your understanding of this powerful word, and not only the word, but the reality. The reality of how Jesus Christ is Lord, and how when we say this word in our prayers or in our everyday life, it is to be honored, to be reverenced, and we are to follow up our words with action, with submission, and with humbleness. Amen? So when we say this word, Lord, let us mean it in all humility that he truly is Lord and that we are blessed to be his servants. And I pray that I, that you, that everybody who's listening would do as 1 Peter 3.15 says, in your heart, honor Christ as Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for this word, Devla. Thank you, God, for, for having your way. Lord, we know that we are your servants, Lord, and if we did not know, I pray that we know now that we are your servants and that we would submit to you, that we would submit to your lordship, that we wouldn't just say, Lord, but that we would follow up with saying, what shall I do for you? How can I please you? What could I do to make you happy? I am at your service, Master. So, Lord, have your way with us and take over. I pray that we would never look at this word in pain, but that we would honor it, that we would respect it, and that we would do what you tell us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Well, girls, I want to talk to all of those who are out there who never heard the gospel before. I know we hear it a lot. We are called to preach it. We say it a lot. But I don't think we don't grasp the beauty of the gospel. We, our mind can't comprehend it. One of my favorite quotes from a theologian says, we, we need to hear the gospel every day because we forget it every day. Amen? So what is this glorious gospel that we always hear? Because according to Romans chapter 1, verse 16, it's so powerful. It is the power of God unto salvation. This gospel gives power to bring salvation. Amen? So what is this gospel? And first we need to know that God is holy. He is righteous and he is just. He will not pardon sin. He will not just wave a wand and say, I love you. Your sins are removed. That would be an unjust judge. Amen. We see today throughout the shows how people commit serious crimes. And you don't see a judge saying, I love you very much, so I'm just going to pardon your sin. I'm just going to let you go. But justice has to be served. That's how it is. That's how God is. And because he is holy and we are sinners, we violate his law. We break his law every day. We, according to Romans chapter 3, if you ever read it, we do horrible things. The Bible says we drink down iniquity as if it was water. That even on our good day, all of our righteous deeds are as filthy rags to him. That's how bad of sinners we are. And I think that we need to get this. We need to understand that we're sinners. There is no one that sins less and does worse their things or does better things. All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, according to Romans chapter 3. So what does a just God do with sinners who is breaking his law? The just thing for him to do would be to send everybody to hell. And he would be perfectly just in doing so. He would be righteous in doing so. Because we don't deserve heaven. We don't deserve, deserve grace, love, and mercy. What we deserve is a just 
thing that he would do, and that would be to send us all to hell. But here comes the good news, because that is the bad news. But the good news is it's found in Jesus Christ, our Lord, who came and set us free, who took upon our sins. He took them upon himself. And not only did he take them, but he suffered the just justice that we deserve. Amen. According to 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, He who knew no sin became sin so that we may be the righteousness of Christ. So what happens there? We have Jesus who is perfectly sinless, never sinned. And we have millions of people who are sinners. How does one man take upon all the sins of the world? What happens then to his righteousness? His righteousness is given to us when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. Because if he was to just take away our sins, that would just leave us in a state of innocence. But it is righteousness that is required. The Bible says, unless your righteousness surpasses those of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the head the kingdom of heaven. You must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And there is only one who is perfect, and that is Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord Jesus. So in doing so, he takes upon our sins. He takes upon the, the wrath of God that we deserve. It's a substitute. He takes our place and gives us his righteousness so that we could be saved. Amen? So in order for you to be saved tonight, there is nothing you could do. You need to know that. There is no nothing that you could ever do to gain favor with a holy and righteous God. The only way that you could be reconciled to him is by placing your faith in Jesus Christ, according to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. It is not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any should boast. He doesn't want boasting. What he wants is a broken and contrite heart. So I pray that whoever here never received salvation know that you are a sinner, that there is nothing you could do to save yourself. That's the problem. But the solution is there is one who came to save you, who came to seek and to save you so that you would be saved. Not only for heaven, but so that your whole life would change and that you would be his servant, his slave. Amen? So I pray that you would do as Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. So just say, Lord God, I admit that I am a sinner, but you are the perfect Savior. Forgive me of all of my sins. Wash me and cleanse me in your blood. I acknowledge that you are Lord. And I want to submit to you. I lay my life down just as you laid your life down for me. I give my life to you. Help me to be your slave, your servant. Teach me to do your will. Teach me to be pleasing to you. Help me to grow more in holiness every day. In Jesus' name, amen.